Well, at, at, you know, when I was in my 20s, I joined um, Jean-Luc Ponty's band. And I, I did a tour tours with him, about three tours, uh, 1975, 76, and 77. At the end of that tour, Jean-Luc Ponty didn't have anything planned as far as any kind of touring. And for some reason, my name came up um, as someone to audition for Genesis. And um, it was a, the bass player named Alfonso Johnson. He was from the band Weather Report. Great bass player, but they needed a guitarist that could play bass. Um, and he wasn't a, really a guitarist. I mean, he played a little bit, but they needed someone who could actually play guitar, second instrument, maybe bass. So my name came up from Alfonso audition. He didn't get the job, obviously, but he recommended me. Prior to that, I had heard Genesis, of course, but I was never um, that aware of their music. Jean-Luc Ponty actually played me, gave me a cassette. On one side, he had... A trick of the tail on the other side, wind and weathering. Now, not the whole album because cassettes couldn't even f hold all of that music because they actually did pretty long, long uh, records at that time, longer than most people. Most people did like 45 minutes and that was it, but they would do longer. So anyway, what happened was I started listening to them and I loved them. I was thinking this is great music because I kind of grew up in uh, when I was a teenager listening to not only American music, but British bands like King Crimson and uh, Procol Harum. These bands I loved. I mean, it was more artistic music than just, here's a pop song. So progressive rock was sort of like in me. So when I heard Genesis, that kind of filled that void that I hadn't heard in a long time. So when I heard that they wanted to have me audition, I thought to myself, wow, this could be a great opportunity to, to get back into the kind of music that I really loved listening to, but I had never really played with too many groups. So I got the call uh, from uh, the manager of uh, Jean-Luc Ponty. He said, they'd like to get in touch with you. I, I gave him your number. So obviously I wasn't in Jean-Luc Ponty's band anymore, <laughs> but it's because they didn't have any tours coming up or anything. So it was nice of them to put my name forward. So I actually went to New York and auditioned with Mike, just Mike. I didn't know how this was going to go. Prior to that, they sent me a cassette of five songs, I believe it was, and two or three of them were brand new from, and then there were three, but they had the old titles on them. Instead of a song called Down and Out, it said 5-8, because it was in the time signature 5-8. And another song was called Calypso, but that was actually Follow You, Follow Me, because it had kind of a calypso beat. A couple other songs were Squonk uh, from the live album, Seconds Out, and another one was, um, Los, uh, not Los Endos, but um, Dance on a Volcano. And uh, I can't remember what the next other song was. Maybe that was it. And so I learned those songs. I was living in California at the time, and I, I, got, I went in a room and I just thought, I'll learn these songs. And what happened was I go to New York, and I was apparently the first... American guitarist to audition because he had five or four or five on the list to do that day. But mine was at 10 in the morning. So I went over there and I met Mike for the first time. And, you know, p tall Mike. And I, and he even says it in his book. It's, it was kind of hard to understand him because he's not only was I not used to just talking to a lot of British people, but especially a British person that mumbles like Mike. And uh, he will admit that. And, um, so we first talked, then we sat down in chairs and with a pedal board in front of us. Now, I hadn't been used to any kind of pedal effects other than straight guitar and maybe a wah-wah, something like that. And so I looked down and here was this pedal board and, and he had monitors going and he had a cassette player. And he says, well, let's try this song first. And then he put on the song Squonk. And started playing and I just play along. Mike had a guitar in his hands, but I just played. And we went through about half of the song and he stopped it. He goes, okay, well, that would be enough. Let me try the next one. He went to the fast forward and did another song. I can't remember which one. It might've been Down and Out or Dance on a Volcano. And I played this. So we went through this series of just playing maybe a couple minutes of a song and then going on to the next one, which to me made me think, maybe I'm not doing this well enough, you know, because he doesn't want to hear the whole song. So we got through with those songs, 
and I'll never forget what Mike said. He says, um, I think you're the one. That's what he said. And I thought, wow, just after me just playing these songs. So he says, I'll, I'll call you at the, it was at the Plaza Hotel in New York. I'll call you at about five o'clock and I'll give you a list of the songs that I want you to learn for the tour. And this, I think this was December of 77. And they had a tour uh, uh, planned, they were going to start rehearsals in February of the next year. So there wasn't much time, but they didn't have a guitarist, which really surprised me. Just, uh, here's a tour coming up, but they don't have a guitarist because Steve had left. And so I thought, okay, I'll go to the hotel. And I remember ringing my wife and I said, uh, you know, I, um, I think I have the job, but do you, I'm not sure if I want to do it. Because I thought to myself, I was used to coming from a band where the guitar was like a solo instrument. Jean-Luc Pani, if he wasn't playing solos, I was doing it. It was more like I was really involved. And I wasn't sure how much involvement I would have in Genesis. I couldn't tell sometimes what the keyboard part was, what the guitar part was. Was this going to be too simple? Which was ridiculous because um, in the end, it turned out to be the greatest band I've ever worked with. But at the time, I was thinking, my wife said, just take the job. Are you kidding? And so we, um, I waited at my hotel, and it was about 6 o'clock. I thought, maybe Mike's not going to call me. And he called me up, and he says, um, I'll, I'll come over to your room, and I'll get, get together with you on the songs that we're going to do. And he came over. He was very nice, and we started writing down the songs that I should learn. And uh, he gave me a cassette with all these things on, and it was like 26 songs. Now, I didn't realize at the time that I was going to um, not play all 26 songs. We're going to play parts of some of the songs. There's going to be medleys and things like this. So it was very interesting that this is how it all kind of began for me. And uh, and then here we are today. Did you uh, see, so you, you thought you might have to learn all 26 songs. Yeah, and I did. And you did in two months, something like that, before the tour started? Yeah, actually, I think it was a little less than that, but um, it might have been a might have been only a month or so, but yeah. What happened too is I said to Mike in the hotel room uh, when he was talking to me about the songs, I said, you know, I recognize a couple names uh, that you mentioned that are going to be auditioning because there was three or four people after me. And I said, the, the couple names that I recognize are very good players. And so what is it about me that I got this and they didn't? And he said, well, you knew the songs. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you're the only one that came prepared. Because when I got these four or five songs, I just sat down and I learned them note for note. I even learned parts that I didn't know if that was my part. And he said a couple of the people came in and just said, so what key uh, is this song in? In other words, you don't have to ask what key it is. You're supposed to know. And another guy said, you know, uh, what style do you want me to play? I mean, to me, Genesis is a style already. That It's not country, it's not uh, rock, it's not jazz. You know, it's Genesis. You know, Genesis is its own style. So it's kind of a funny question to ask. So these were good players, though. Uh, so it's just a matter of I came prepared and I could play it also. You know, you have to obviously have the goods to do it. But I was kind of surprised but uh, that other people wouldn't learn these songs. I mean, if you're going to try to get in a band with Genesis, you better work on it. You know, because these are great players, great music. And so that's why apparently I got it. And then, plus, Mike and I got along very well. And I could sort of understand him. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I read some, somewhere, um, possibly in the book, that the, 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 the uh, big Genesis book, where you said that um, you, you met Chester in, in uh, the airport and he'd said right. he was playing with this band called Genesis. And, and at that point... Possibly it was still the, the tail end of the Peter Gabriel period, was it? I'm not sure. Yes. He, uh, no, no, it was, it was the tail end of Phil. Tail, right. No, not tail end. It was the beginning of Phil. Beginning of Phil, right. Yeah. Uh, but you were very surprised because you'd, you'd thought of Genesis more of the theatrical Gabriel. Right. It, yeah, exactly. And I, now I remember that. It, it's exa we were in uh, O'Hare uh, Field, you know, the airport, and uh, ran into Chester was on tour with The Wiz, uh, I believe it was, and... Um, I was saying, so what are you doing now? This was 1977. He says, I'm, playing, I'm going to be playing with Genesis. And I thought, Genesis, are you kidding? And, I would, and the only thing that I saw of Genesis at the time was there was a, um, I think he was a Canadian interviewer named Chip Monk. And, and he was doing this interview with Mike Love, Peter Gabriel, saxophone player Charles Lloyd, 
and uh, John McLaughlin. And so I was watching the show because I was a big fan of John McLaughlin. I was, a, you know, I was a big kind of jazz fusion nut. And uh, so I thought, I'm going to watch this show. And Charles Lloyd was a saxophone player. And all of a sudden, there's Peter Gabriel. And I think he had his head shaved in the middle. And he was uh, sitting there, and he was kind of rocking back and forth while he was talking. Didn't say much, very quiet. And John McLaughlin did a lot of the talking, and Mike Love. And some of them played together. So that, but when they, when they showed Peter Gabriel, they played a clip from a Genesis show called in the area of, of Supper's Ready called Willow Farm, where he's wearing the, the flower. So in my mind, I'm thinking Chester's joining a band where he's going to be wearing a flower in costumes. That's really what I thought, because that's all I have ever seen of Genesis. I mean, I heard them probably. So, but then I didn't realize that now they were less theatrical and Phil was the singer. When I heard that, I thought, I got to listen to this band. If Chester's joining the band, it must be good. So that's around the same time that uh, Jean-Luc Ponty gave me the cassette of their music and I became a fan. So that, that story is exactly right. That, that's uh, When I saw that Chester was going to join, I thought, that's going to be a pretty nice band to be in. And also when they called me, I thought, there's credibility here that Chester's in the band. He must be a good band. So it all kind of came together that way. I forgot about that story. <laughs> now, um, so going forward from there, you obviously have to join the band to start the tour. What are your memories of that, that very first time and the tour, yeah. meeting the other guys? Yeah, well, I remember flying to England and um, the first day I was picked up at, uh, I, I believe it was a hotel by uh, uh, Jeff Banks. He was... Um, one of, one of the, uh, the keyboard tech at the time, I think it was Tony Banks's keyboard tech was named Jeff Banks, and no relation. And uh, he picked me up, and he says, "We're on the way. We're going to pick up Tony Banks." And I thought, "Oh, okay." And I had not ever really known these guys or know much about them. So we we stopped at a place at where Tony lived at the time, and he came out. Tony's a very quiet guy as well, so I, I didn't know what to think. You know, I, I was kind of nervous meeting these guys for the first time. And I always had this feeling that the British are, are in a way, much more poised and much more proper. So, and he was, you know, just sitting in the front, not talking much. And and we get to the place uh, where we're rehearsing. I think it was at Shepperton Studios, I think. And we get there and <clears throat> uh, we, then I, but Mike I had already met. So their friendly face, I knew Mike. Then Phil walked in. And I saw Phil, I said, that must be Phil Collins. <laughs> this is how ridiculous it is. I didn't know what he even looked like. But, and then right away when Phil walks in, it seems like the place kind of perked up. And uh, we, and like I said, I was still a little bit nervous. And we started playing some songs. And I, I was ready to play all of the songs that they sent me. Not knowing that the first day we're probably not going to play anything. We're going to just get our equipment together tune up, make sure some things. And I don't think we even played a song the first day. We didn't play a song until the second day. But I do remember one thing that I'll never forget this because I, I got more relaxed when I saw this, that during a, a tea break, I looked over and I saw Mike, Tony, and Phil standing there. And Tony Banks was leaning on the table like this, but his hand was on a piece of bread like, you know, a big loaf of uh, bread. It's kind of like this, and it's kind of like sticking up. Mike was running a fork through his beard, and Phil was going like this. He's, he's, he always, always bit his nails. I found this out later. And I said, these guys aren't poised British guys. These are just a rock and roll band with a bunch of sloppy guys, you know, which made me actually feel better because I didn't have to feel like that this was some high-class British guys. Anyway, it was very funny to look over. I wish I had a photo of this. I would just take that picture of those guys just slobbing out at the table. But I had never done, you know, tea breaks at the time either, so that was kind of new to me. But anyway, that was, that's a true story. It was just so funny. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're all very casual guys in, in so many ways, really. So easy to work with. I don't think I could have worked with them all these years just for the money, you know what I mean? Because they were just really nice people to work with and... Easy going. Um, Phil, uh, the this, this sort of reputation for, for Phil, people would describe as a kind of 
you know, the, the, the classic cheeky chappy mm -hmm. um, life and soul of the group, maybe. Um, Tony, um, quite shy. Yeah. Um, and Mike, um, a little, you know, friendly, as, as he says himself, a, a little kind of suppressed and withdrawn, mm -hmm. it, you know, from from the British upbringing. Right. You know. um, I wonder if you'd like to just give us your sense of the, the characters. The, the, uh, how, how would you describe your your observations of them? Yeah, I, I think, you know, Mike seems to be... I would look at Mike as if he was a musician, he could be an ambassador. He's the guy that's kind of between Tony and, and Phil. Not that Tony and Phil don't get along, but they are very different people, very different people. And, um, like, Tony is a very reserved person. I've noticed over the years less reserved than he used to be. But in the beginning, I actually thought that Tony didn't like me because I thought maybe there's a thing between him and the guitar. You know, the keyboard player and the guitar player it kind of could possibly uh, not work out. Although Steve and him, I think, worked very well together. But I know that their parting wasn't very good that at first, you know. And so I thought maybe there was a little bit of, oh, uh, he's a guitar player and I'm an American, you know. Because Tony was so reserved, I thought maybe that was a problem, that uh, that he didn't like me. And um, but it's it's funny over like within that first tour, I think that changed, and all of a sudden I realized that was just the way he he, he is. He's just not really outwardly like I'm going to be friendly to you immediately. Um, and and Mike being easily um, right away, you know that he's kind of embracing you. Phil, on the other hand, is is very friendly from the start, from the get-go. You know, he's just very outgoing. He's a performer, you know, as well. And I think that that comes off in his in his performance on stage as well. So he seems very accessible immediately. Um, whether he is or not, we don't, you know, a lot of people don't know because um, I'm very close to him as far as uh, I've been with him ever since he started his solo career and I've been with him ever since. So... I find him very easy to talk to, and I find him, um, he doesn't put me off, and he'll he'll ring me up just to ask me some question, like, do you remember the chord on this one song? Because I have to do a show somewhere playing piano. So I always appreciate that when he does that to me. And plus, he had me join his first uh, first album with In the Air Tonight and all that, and I've been there ever since. So yeah, they're all very different people. Phil, Phil seems like more like, in America, we'd call it a blue collar. Uh, person more from the middle class and Mike and Tony seem a little bit more upper class but yet you know it was very hard to ever see Tony wearing even a jacket you know and because uh, he was always wearing t-shirts and jeans I think he would totally rebelled from that lifestyle that he probably grew up in you know so that's sort of my observations of the three guys but they're very each one of them has a specific thing that they do so well musically um I think Phil kind of adds kind of like the rhythmic hip part of Genesis. Tony adds this like the very grandiose, I don't mean that in a negative way, but his stuff is like orchestrated. It's the big sound of Genesis. Um, and Mike gives it like these great guitar riffs and he kind of brings it all together. And I think you can't have Genesis without one of these three people. I really don't. And, um, you know, even though Phil is a uh, the big entertainer, I mean, he is the singer, he's a songwriter. Genesis doesn't exist without Tony Banks, for instance. If you don't have that sound, there's no Genesis, you know. And Mike is is a, you know, Mike is a songwriter. He's a guitarist, writes music, and the things he comes up with, I would have never come up with. And some people ask me, do you think he's a good guitarist? I think he's a really good guitarist. He's maybe not technically a fantastic guitar player, but what he comes up with are things that better guitar players wouldn't come up with. And when he plays it, he executes it a certain way that even if I play the same thing, it just sounds better when Mike plays it. So I think that's why Mike will play guitar on a lot of the things that he plays guitar on the records. I'll play guitar and things that maybe Steve Hackett played and then I'll play bass on the stuff that Mike played guitar on so it's everybody's got their place in the band and I think it's really interesting so uh, you mentioned Steve Hackett um, now that th through the Steve Hackett period uh, he has he has tr tremendous number of fans 
of his style of playing. It's kind of people talk about, you know, the, the sort of <coughs> the kind of sweetness and the dedication that he had to the that to that sound. Um, did you feel um, overawed in any way? In, in a sense, what sense were you stepping into Steve Hackett's shoes, or was it wasn't it seen like that? It's funny. Um, what Mike when Mike told me about what what he needed from me as a guitar player, <clears throat> and he did say, you know, what well, you'll be playing guitar and more of the music that Steve played. Um, he said, I don't need you to be Steve, but he says there's some there's some specific signature lines and, and notes that he plays that are either cues or whatever that I need you to do it. But I knew that already. I mean, when I heard the music, I said, I know I have to play that, but I can also go away and do this as well. Um, first of all, Steve is a, a fantastic guitarist and he's a, he's a really great songwriter and all the parts he put in Genesis are fantastic. So I knew what I needed to play but I also knew what I didn't have to play. And Mike wanted me to explore a little bit of that as well. And so uh, that's what I did. And if I was having any problem with it, because maybe I didn't know exactly what sound he used, like did he use a chorus pedal on this one? Did he use a delay on this one? I would ask Mike, you know, what's this? Sometimes Mike would just come over to me and says, you know, what he used on this one is this. And because I wasn't as familiar with these pedal effects that, Steve used as because I didn't come from that, I, but I did come from listening to a lot of British music, so I, I aspired to do that, and so it kind of got me out of my jazz fusion uh, style that I had and kind of go over into the more of the British rock uh, progressive rock style, and which I enjoyed. And uh, it's funny that uh, now with uh, blogging and with YouTube and things. Sometimes there will be a video up or something like that on YouTube, and it's funny how people will make comments about it. It's funny how everybody's got an opinion. And some people like what I did. Some people don't like what I do. Um, it's almost like, you know, they say, oh, you know, Steve did this better than you. Some people say, I mean, the majority is very kind. They really like what you do. They say, uh, well, Steve and Daryl are def definitely different players. We like them both. But there's always occasionally the person who doesn't like you. And sometimes I think to myself, you know, I didn't take his job away from him. He left the band. They chose me. If you're angry, get angry at them <laughs> because they're the ones who chose me. And it's really funny because Steve and I get along very well. Uh, when we went uh, to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, this was a couple of years ago or three years ago, I can't remember, um, we sat together at the table, and I really enjoy talking to him. And I was just talking to him about also on one of his records, he did a, a version of Your Own Special Way, which I thought was just great. And so I had to tell him, I said, you know, that version is fantastic. It doesn't sound like Genesis. It's like his own thing. And Paul Carrick sang and did a, just did a wonderful job. So I don't think people know that actually we actually like each other. There's no rivalry between us. But um, people like to create that rivalry, rivalry. And I think no matter who you are, whatever band you're in, you're always, if you're the second guy, you're always going to be the other guy. Uh, even in um, the Rolling Stones, it's, it's Brian Jones was the original with Keith Richards. And then anybody after that is, you know, the other guy. You know, although I think Ron Wood has become, you know, everybody knows the band with him. But uh, it's just funny how that happens in men's. But for me... It's not been a problem. I mean, I found going in and playing Steve's parts are great parts to play and then interpreting them my own way. As I went along, I started interpreting it even more and more until it becomes my own. And uh, they don't even notice it after a while. That If you listen to the original, then maybe the part I'm playing now is very different from the original, but it kind of grew into something else. And, but you can do that. But you don't go into a band like Genesis and say, well, I'm going to do my own thing. You know, because your own thing isn't what they're looking for. But they're looking for you to maybe to be original and uh, take what's there and then take it somewhere else. Or uh, take it to somewhere tasteful. And I think that's what I did. I guess um, the fact that they chose you and, and Chester, American musicians, yeah. with quite a jazz background as well suggests that they wanted 
some kind of change in their sound or to, that you guys might influence it in some way. I don't know. <clears throat> Did they put that to you at all? Well, I, you know, I think Phil was uh, very influential on in trying to get more of that Americanism in there as well, more of a little bit of a jazz influence, because he loved bands like Weather Report, Earth, Wind and Fire, stuff like that, besides loving the Beatles, and, and, and he loved Motown music. So he's always given put, it, put that influence into their music anyway. And so I think having an American drummer and even American guitarist, maybe he thought, you know, this would be a good influence on the band. Uh, I don't know if that's the case, but that's what happened anyway. Um, I, th I think every band has to grow. Some, some people may just love the old Genesis with Peter Gabriel, and I think it was great. And I think, but I think they've both done better on their own now. I think Peter's did great with his solo career. Genesis did great with Phil as their singer. Um, I think bands have to progress, and it's not that their music wasn't good at the time, but things change, and that's just the way it goes. If, if they write a hit song, which their first hit really was Follow You, Follow Me, really, at least in America, then they got a bigger audience. But I don't think they ever compromised on their records. When I listened to their, whenever I'd get a new record, or, like they would always send me a demo uh, with working titles on it, saying, here's the new album, we're going to be doing this. I would always be surprised, and I would say, here's a great pop song, here's a great, and now here's a great Genesis song, like a uh, deep cut on an album. You know, So I don't think they've ever totally changed into, like, I'm going to be a pop band, but it just so happens as when they are creating this music, and they are just progressing. And you know, I don't think anybody ever did anything in the band that said, well, the reason we're doing this is because we want to make more money. You know, I think what's happened is they've always wanted to create something new and artistic as well as something that's accessible to an audience. And I think it's, they've been successful.